Hey guys, welcome back to The Syndicate, the show where we get the smartest angels and VCs around the world and we grill them on startup investing so I can steal all their best, give it to you guys, implement it for us, and hopefully make something that's interesting. Today, we've got a pretty awesome podcast planned. I've got Peter Cowley. Peter's done quite a bit. He was UK Business Angel of the Year last, not last year, 2014, chair of the Cambridge Business Angels. He's in the UK Business Angels Association and looks like he's an investor in Syndicate Room. I want to dig a little bit deeper into that in a sec, but thanks for coming today, Peter. Yes, thank you. Actually, I, I like to be known better as a serial entrepreneur first <laughs> rather than an angel investor because I've spent nearly 40 years uh, setting up businesses and, and selling them and closing them, etc. about a dozen businesses over the years. So I, I swapped from being an entrepreneur over, you know, between the ages of 20 and 50s uh, into being an angel investor about 10 years ago. How did you jump into entrepreneurship? Uh, don't know. It's a good question, actually. I, uh, if anybody's Australian is listening to this, they will, they will know a name called guy called Dick Smith, and I worked for Dick Smith, which won't work me think you, Matt, but um, between school and university in 1974, Dick Smith is the most famous entrepreneur in Australia by a long way. His face is all over the place. And that probably rubbed off. My father was a self-employed person. Maybe my mother did the books. Maybe that rubbed off. And so I just wanted to take risks, basically. And you've taken risks. It sounds like you've done a really good job of that, especially if you spent 40 years and now you're at the stage of leading a couple of the top angel lists, or not angel lists, top of angel groups in the in the world, I think. How big is Cambridge well, Angels? Uh, Cambridge Angels is, is, is probably the most famous in the UK and, and probably the deepest popular one. It's also pretty, I was in Brussels recently giving a talk because people have heard of the Cambridge Angels. So yeah, chairing that is, and, but it isn't just the chairing, that's obviously relevant. That's a voluntary role that takes a lot of time. The important thing is I've learned all I've learned from this group of 70 people, that the huge amount, all my journey from even knowing what the word angel meant, which would be in 08, so only nine years ago to where I am now, has, uh, has come from the group I've worked with. What type of investments do you guys look at? Uh, we tend to be as a group, and I assume that my investment types are similar to that, tend to be deepish tech, B2B. Cambridge in the UK is known very specifically for that some life sciences though my background isn't life sciences but mainly uh something where it doesn't have to have a patent but it must have a a, a good defensibility to, to invest in it b2b to c works i've got a little bit of b2c but very little i should say that all my portfolio on all my failures and successes and all my criteria on my own website petercowley.org that's very important to me just to be i'm trying to encourage our industry to be more transparent and, and, I, and i'm leading by example because that's been up there now for about four years is that list and so if there's a failure i'll put on there and put my what my view of the failure is and my investment criteria are all there as well so go back to your question b2b deep tech and i like the transparency we were talking before the show so i found out or realized I didn't have the fact that our syndicate charges carry on our application fee or application page. Got that set up. I like the fact that you're going towards transparency. Talk about the problems that you're seeing in the industry and why you make such a strong focus on this. Well, obviously, I've got plenty of examples of that um, over the years. Um, and just before I talk about it, I, I feel so strongly about this that I've actually started a publishing project called the Invested Investor which is a sack of podcasts at the moment. So, you know, we'll cross share our podcasts, hopefully, and eventually a book towards the end of next year, which is me. At the moment, I've interviewed 13 or 14 entrepreneurs and angels and asked about their journeys, their failures, uh, how they related to their investors, etc. So the thesis behind this is that if one joins a journey for with an entrepreneur who needs early stage investing, and many companies don't, but they, you know, I'm, I'm working in that space, and that relationship is built on trust, openness, honesty, and transparency. That relationship will lead to better outcomes. You know, I can liken it rather glibly, unfortunately, to a marriage. An open, not an open marriage, but an honest, trusting, <laughs> good relationship will lead to a longer term successful. And that's definitely true because I see so many, and it's not, clearly it's not just the entrepreneurs that are not as open as they should be. It's also the angels. I mean, angels in general, tend to be older than entrepreneurs, not as much as a generation older, but usually half a generation. And, and that's or more. And, and, and you know, with life's experience, <laughs> we, we might, you know, we, we've got the ability to be less open. What I'm advocating, and we'll probably have a code of contact of some conduct of some sort, is to 
build that trust as soon as you can. Very difficult to do it when you're first pitching as an entrepreneur to an angel. But if you can build that up, certainly from the point of closing onwards, you will end up with a very much better journey. I agree. And I like that you point out certainly from closing, because a lot of times it just comes down to first you need to get the check and then you you sort out some of the problems after. It's easier to ask for forgiveness because otherwise you're not going to get the permission. The, in fact, I've got a podcast which hasn't been a, a very well-known angel in the UK. Uh, who's done, it was actually through 3x on his cash on cash. He's got some lot more investments, so he's, he's been successful. He calls the first board meeting an oh shit board meeting because they get into that, the entrepreneur and the angels, and they suddenly realize all the things that they didn't know when they closed the check. So the checks arrived, paid in the bank, they have a board meeting, and it's oh shit. And he's quite used to that. So he doesn't actually have a problem with that in, in the way that uh, an entrepreneur needs to be driven, passionate, and they need to put a level of spin on something, not too strongly, hopefully, because they're selling equity at that point, you know, and they need to be able to do that. So it's that getting that compromise right or that, that balance right is really important. What I particularly don't like is where people who've had a, a previous uh, entrepreneurial journey that's failed are not open about that. You know, the fact that they've had a failure. I've got one example that I can't possibly tell their name where it, it, the, the chap, the founder of this new business classed it as a good exit, which actually left trade creditors. That's not a good exit. If he'd said, I've had this journey and it failed and these are the reasons why, actually that's a very big tip for me. I like the transparency and at the same time, especially given, I mean, we've seen some very interesting startups recently, Theranos and others, which are more or less blatant fraud. Where does What's the best way for investors to vet startups and startups to vet investors? Because when you're initially dating, you don't necessarily share all the dirty laundry. No, a good, a good question. It's, it's a combination of two things. One is uh, doing due diligence on each other. And so I, I actually have a, when I put slides up in front of entrepreneurs or angels, I use a double headed llama or so that we're showing this <laughs> once you do due diligence. And that's really important that the entrepreneurs do a lot of due diligence diligence on the investors and I do that on my co-investors and I will sack and I have done potential pledges of co-investment because I don't think they're the right people to co-invest with so that's a really important part of it so it's a matter of doing it online and offline online can be done in the UK at least the uh, company's house which is a record of all previous companies is very it's pretty transparent there's plenty of information on there offline is taking references taking references with people that may be on their LinkedIn or people they know. So that's that's the first point, is to do as much as that. Secondly, which is also very important, and this is there's a conflict here, is that if I'm going to invest in an entrepreneur, I want to spend quite a lot of time with them, to get to know them, to see them under pressure, to see what, you know, to try and work out how truthful they're going to be and how we'll work together, and maybe the chemistry if I'm going on the board. That, of course, goes against the fact that I want to give the entrepreneur a check as soon as possible so they can stop talking to me because they're wasting the time talking to me and get on with building the business. How do you balance that? So I know you talked about the challenge, but when, when is enough enough and time to propose? <laughs> well, propose goes a long way before it's a bit like, you know, you know engagement, I suppose. And I hadn't thought of it that way, but I can see where you're going with this. So proposing is what is the pledge? And then the, <laughs> the uh, consummation of the marriage is the check arriving. Um, I, I, on my website, again, I've got a load of statistics. And one of the things there, which I think is on the website, if it isn't, I'll put it on later on today, is the time between initial contact and close. And my average over the last 40 or so deals 40 or so investments is in 5.2 months. So this is about a month, month and a half of that is probably legals. So that gets you down to about three months or so. So it's around about three months on average. Now I have done it in much less, I've taken much more. And it isn't the actual lapse time, of course, it's the amount of time spent communicating with the entrepreneur or entrepreneurial team. And either by face to face, which one can work better with, facial expressions, body language and everything, or email. So there is no optimum time, clearly, but I would think if I'm going to be on the deal lead, I will probably spend 25 to 35 hours um, in communication with the entrepreneurs before I will allow the deal to be closed. That definitely makes sense, especially because you're tying your reputation to them. I want to ask a, a follow-on question. So you invested in Syndicate Room, and they're facilitating investments in 
potentially startups that people have not met. Do you invest in only local companies or do you invest abroad or other companies that you haven't personally met? Yes, yeah, so I don't know if you want to talk about Citigroup, I can do that, but if, to answer your second part of the question, no, I have a rule which um, is fairly common for the very active angel investors anywhere in the world, I think, is I invest within a certain distance of home. And I actually put this on my website as 90 minutes on public transport. So if I'm driving, you can't do anything. I, I think what driving, although I have a nice car and I enjoy driving, I think it's a complete waste of time for work reasons and I roll on the autonomous vehicle as far as I'm concerned. So this means I've got somewhere I can go and see the entrepreneur that's not too far away, get to know them there. And then if I'm close to the entrepreneur later, either on the board, board observer, or want to keep in touch and help, it's not too far to travel. So I don't, I have two companies out of my 63 I've invested in that have are abroad, both have flipped. So one flipped to California and one flipped to Bulgaria actually. Uh, but in principle, I invest locally. Now that goes against, various things you know crowdfunding as you point out you can invest anywhere with that i mean our, our our crowd in israel is quite keen for me to invest i won't do that i won't i, I will not invest across the board i don't need to anyway because the uk is a hotbed of interesting startups but if i lived in um, greece or albania or something like that i would have to almost certainly do cross-border investment you also have the incredible tax scheme with the uk right can you talk a little bit about that business angel tax scheme and writing off? Yes, we do, and there's a number of, well, there are other tax schemes around. I mean, Hawaii used to have an even better one, but I don't think it does now. So some of the states have better. Um, in the UK, yes, it, it's embarrassing. I, was, I gave a talk in Denmark a few years ago, and they gave me a round of applause when I put up the tax scheme, which I thought was wrong, because <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in charge of it. So very briefly, the UK, your downside protection for a very early stage is about 80% of the investment very early stage, that's under 150,000 pounds, that's on failure, and about 50% downside protection if it's later stage. So, you know, you've got a big parachute there to help you do that. I don't invest specifically for that, and I've invested in deals, you know, um, with liquidation preferences which don't allow that. You've got to, one of the rules is you've got to have the same shares as the founders. Um, I'll invest in, and in many cases, after you've got multiple rounds, you have an exit, you'll actually end up with because you've got to have a minimum of three years before you, this tax relief cuts in, you end up paying back the tax you've got and not getting tax relief on it. So it, it doesn't apply to all deals by any means at all. Of course I use it. There are lots of angels who will only do it with that. So we have a situation in the UK where the tax reliefs actually are driving some of the success. Personally, I wouldn't do that. I would probably invest in less, but probably only 15 to 20% of the companies less, you know, if I didn't have the tax relief. What do you think about the implications of Brexit on the startup tech scene? <laughs> I've been asked that many times in various parts of the world. <laughs> um, I think in terms of funding, uh, there's no evidence that's going to be a problem. The budget introduced, our budget a few weeks ago in the UK introduced effective replacement for the European Investment Bank funding through our British Business Bank. So funding, I don't think we'll notice much difference. Um, in terms of trade, early stage, Trade doesn't seem to occur much with, within Europe or to Europe. Most of my early stage companies are either trying for the States or trying for the Far East. Dealing cross trade cross border, and I've done it for years. I lived in Bavaria for five years. It, it's not easy. You know, you've got language and other things. The big, big issue though is talent, and that is huge. So talent, um, attracting the right level of talent. In the UK, we've been very lax, I think various government policies uh, over the last probably 30 years in educating enough technology, STEM, or STEAM as it's called now with art, uh, undergrads and grads. And so we are very short of, because I invest mainly in tech, whether it's life sciences or, or, or information tech, we're short of these people. And that is a big issue. That, that, that's what's going to be, if it's a hard Brexit, if it's the right level of soft, it won't be so bad. If it's a hard Brexit, then we will struggle with that. Of course, with robotization, we've got another issue because, uh, but that's a different thing because we, we, you know, the the pickers, the fruit pickers, tend to be from East Europe. They're not coming over now so much because the not because of Brexit and the fear of not going, being staying, purely because the pound has weakened so strongly that at the moment any cash sending back to their home country is less. So, if you were going to start a company today, where would you? base it, not necessarily where you're working from, but where would you legally base it? 
if I personally, as a British citizen, oh, clearly here at home, <laughs> okay. generally, if I was a world citizen, you mean? Well, we'll take world citizen. It makes it a little bit more broad. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. Okay. Well, obviously, I haven't set any companies up anywhere else. But let's take you're in Switzerland at the moment. Let's take say you're a Swiss. I, I would t tend to base it in the country I'm in because you've got the contacts there. I mean, obviously, the legal systems vary from country to country. The availability of cash is actually more in London. I mean, we, apparently, in early stage finance, we have about half the European amount goes through the UK. So we do get people coming over from Barcelona or Zurich or Prague to UK because they can raise cash more easily. There's also a support network in the UK, which is probably stronger than many places around Europe. We'll come on to outside Europe in a minute. So Barcelona is strong, Berlin is strong, Zurich is probably fairly strong, but there aren't that many places. So if you want a level of smartness in the money, which we, I strongly believe you should have, then coming to London or London, Cambridge or the UK gives you that. If you go further afield and you want, you're in a B2C, clearly you need to move to the Valley. There's no question about that. That is the central point of all B2C type startups in terms of cash, uh, smart money and exits. However, I, I was in Israel earlier this year, and again, a huge amount going on there. Certainly, the activity there is much stronger than it is in, in the UK. So I don't know. I mean, in the end, you, you tend to be based based on family and friends and you know language in, in, where you are, and that's generally a good idea. But if you want to scale rapidly, Israelis tend to scale almost immediately out of Israel into the States. Out of necessity, out of necessity. because of the size necessity. of the market. Correct. Israel and Stockholm, Yes, yeah. Sorry, so, was that so question? Yeah. Oh, there oh, was no, no, no. Yeah. Oh, shoot, oh, shoot. I'm hearing myself. Can you turn that down a little bit? I can turn it down that far, I can't hear it. Let's go okay, on. let me see. Now, okay. Just cut that part in, that, in the middle, Gaspar. Yeah. So, we've talked a bit about transparency. We've talked a bit about your or local investments. But let's talk a little bit about some of the investments you've made. I know you speak a bit about it on your site. You have quite a bit of information. I was looking through some of the companies. Talk to me about some of the companies you've invested in and why. Yeah, so I've also had learned in the last eight years, which is where my investment criteria come from, which you might have seen on the site, the 14 or 15 rules. So I'll, I'll talk about it now, not what I didn't know eight, nine years ago. So now I invest in, I don't invest in products or technology or markets, I invest in people. So I've learned that you need to invest in people. With the right people, and a people in plural, not in the singular, it must be a minimum of two founders, can be three and not four. I, my average, as you'll see on my website, is 1.85, so clearly I have got some single founders in there, but in principle, it's got to be a minimum of two. And these people must be must be right they must have an idea clearly they must have a level of defensibility on the way so i'm backing those people to achieve to execute on something but those people must be able to to listen to 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 pivot to move with the market move with the technology move etc so so i'm in the end i mean I've, I've shown this quite recently when i was flicking through on behalf of eu eu funded research project flicking through a couple of business plans and one of them i actually rejected the business plan without even knowing what it was about. It was just running through the founders and the, and, the, and the board. It was a theoretical one anyway. So it's the people, it comes down to people. But I also, as I said earlier, invest primarily in B2B. Now the reason I do B2B, of my 11 companies I've done, four have been B2C and seven have been B2B. And I feel much more comfortable in B2B environment. I understand what the cost of customer acquisition is. I can understand the lifetime value, etc. So that's my space. And because of my background and because I am in Cambridge and there are plenty of startups like this, I concentrate on a level of technology defensibility, not market defensibility, no, not for speed to market, but something that's defensible by what has been developed. Of course, the risk is higher, the rewards potentially higher, the, the cost of getting somewhere is higher. So there are downsides to that. And sometimes I look at friends who've done a B2C that's grown a brand, I think, well, I should have done that really because you know they've got a great exit out of something that didn't require that much, except luck. But this, uh, I just have my rules and I stick to my rules. Speaking of rules, you said you founded eleven companies to date, which that alone is very impressive. 
would you have invested in yourself looking back at yourself <laughs> as a founder? Um, I did have one of them. <laughs> I, I've generally not taken external investment. These have been set up from ideas. Would I invest in myself as, as a, when I was in my 20s? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think I, I would have, the very first one that took investment, I had the co-founder joined after about two years. So I don't think I'd invest in me until the co-founder had been found, but I certainly do that. Funny enough, this invested investor I mentioned earlier, which actually my younger son, who's 30, is running as an entrepreneur. I, you know, it's a social enterprise with an outcome which is teaching and behavioral change in terms of transparency. I don't think that's investable. <laughs> I can't see anybody investing into that. Then let's talk a bit. Do you have specific sectors that you like to focus? I know you said B2B. B2B typically implies SaaS. Will you look at hardware? Will you look at space tech? Will you look at artificial intelligence plays? Are there any specific sectors that you just hands down avoid besides B2C? Um, yeah, I, I'd like to invest in things uh, where I, I feel I will enjoy the journey and can add value. And my background and money I've made is out of property development, building houses and doing refurbishments and technology. So it's the intersection between construction and technology interests me. But anything that's, and I do a lot of hardware, many, many angels won't touch hardware, but I'm happy with B2B hardware. I understand it. I mean, I've built, I've had a company that's shipped 50,000 products over the years. So I understand what the cost of manufacture is, the build materials, where to get them manufactured, minimum manufacturing volume, stock levels, etc. So uh, what I, I, I don't like AI, the term. I don't mind deep learning and machine learning, but I do not like the term AI. I don't think there's very much intelligence in anything that human race is doing yet in technology. But I would invest in um, SAS, of course, I'll invest in sensing tech, engineering tech. If somebody's coming to approach me for funding, I suggest they look through my, my portfolio and they'll see in there the sort of mix. But I have got a bit of B2C. I've got a company here in Cambridge called Cambridge Nutraceuticals, which is, is a nutraceutical for humans. The reason I put that in there, which is a definitely an outlier and is doing particularly well, is because I knew the founders and they knew them at the, uh, the board. So again, I'm backing people. So I do have exceptions to my rule. And just, I want to jump back to that in a sec, but just for anyone listening, I apologize for the audio quality. There's been some ins and outs a little bit. It looks like I had the wrong microphone selected for my, so it's, we've had some challenges, but I wanted to have Peter on the program because Peter's got a really interesting perspective. So Peter, I want to, I want to transition a bit now to your role leading angel groups and being an active proponent in the ecosystem. How did you you said you've been doing this for eight or nine years. You've met 70 or so angels and learned primarily through them. How do you go from learning to leading? <laughs> yeah, there's two parts to that. There's leading as in deal leading. Can we just cover that very briefly? And then there's leading as in lecturing, mentoring, and, and, and policy work. I do some sort of policy work with, with the UK government. The deal leading is something that we're very short of. It's, this is a person like a syndicate, syndicate model, syndicate room model, which will lead, will pull together an angels or more than one group of angels and lead through the process where they're doing the due diligence, etc., and then closing the round. That is something that certainly in the UK is short. We're very short of that, probably in many parts of the world. So I started, and the reason that I mentioned that is because the way to do it, I think, is to shadow somebody, to go on sort of, just to follow. And that's exactly what I did. I followed a number of deals. So I've led about 25 deals now over the year. But that wasn't quite your question, was it? It was more, you know, the, the figurehead I've become in, in the sector. So that's happened sort of by mistake. I have this wonderful life coach who's done, business life coach, who's done wonders with me, Katie, who in fact is on Investor Investor. If you go onto the website, you'll see her as a, um, is her three of her children are, are, are playing around on the grass with her. Because she, she, had, a, she had a journey which failed. And that's a great one to listen to that. Anyway, so she's been working on where I'm going in life, as I have with her. And I don't know where I have, purely because I'm a very inquisitive person, very curious. So if you go back to eight or nine years, I started visiting um, conferences like the Angel Capital Association Conference in the States, the EBAN conferences in, around Europe, and just collecting information, just listening and building up knowledge. Israel, Singapore, I've been to Bangalore, I've been to... Sweden, Sophia, etc. Just building up this lots of knowledge. 
And it's because of that knowledge and the fact that I'm fairly opinionated, like many angels, and appear to be the ultimately authoritative, <laughs> that calls, calls me forward to be on panels and be on keynotes, etc. And that's given me the confidence and the knowledge and the fact that I haven't had too much pushback, <laughs> but actually people are recognizing me as somebody they want to listen to. Thanks this podcast, probably. So be luck, be, oh wow, that one second. Yeah, the, the video, the video and audio are breaking up a bit. Uh, I can, yes. I don't know it's, oh, that's better. Okay. Oh. So I find that very interesting, being able to, essentially, you learn, you start doing, you start sharing what you're doing, you're opinionated, so people are naturally com come to the charisma. And because of that, you're able to create a bit of a self-fulfilling brand. The brand for investors is very important because not all money is, I mean, all money is green and people need to choose who do I want my investor to be? If you've got everyone knocking on the door, you have options, who do you go to? How would you recommend for investors that are getting into the game, either as angels or starting their own firms, to be able to build up that brand with founders so that they're the first phone call? Very good question, yeah. And then people, I, I don't know whether there's a set prescriptive process for doing that. Um, experience in the end, isn't it? It's um, a great example, which you, you're fully aware of. If, if a VC fund, the VCs are quite different. They manage somebody else's money. They don't lose share in the way that an angel does. That's the big difference between us. What, an angel, what a VC ends up with at the end of a period of time, say a 10 year time, is, is profit share. They, they make a percentage to carry their producing. What they also do or can lose is brand. It's really important that they do it on the way they're seen as a fair um, organization to deal with by the entrepreneurs and that they are successful, of course. So building that brand up takes time, takes effort, and I believe takes openness. So if somebody wants to learn from scratch, the best way for an angel who's going to be active is to join a group of angels who already know what they're doing. So there aren't that many around. There are plenty of angels which are pretty passive angel groups. But there are ones around. It's shorter one or two in Zurich, I'm sure, where you can learn from those. There's plenty. The Santel Angels I spent some time with in the States, and there's quite a few around the UK. So this is following other people. There are other ways of doing it. I mean, in our trade body, which I'm on the board of, the UK BAA, has got an education um, platform which has just been launched. My, to plug again, Investor Investor, that is what it's all about, is education with the transparency attached to it. So there are resources out there, but in the end, it's practice. <laughs> it's actually losing money <laughs> and understanding your own limitations that you're going to have to do. I mean, most angels, particularly ones who have small portfolios, are guaranteed to lose all their money. <laughs> Not guaranteed, of course, but they've got a very good chance to lose all their money. It's a, it's a numbers game, isn't it? It is, and you don't learn to swim until you jump. I want to jump into the lightning round now. How's that sound, Pete? There. I, I, didn't, I didn't know I was doing this, so I don't have to answer it. No worries, no worries. So these will be real easy. The first question, first deal you ever did. First deal I ever did uh, as an angel was the one that led me into it, which is for X computing, which we sold about two and a half years later, the 17X. That oh, spoiled that's me. A very nice one. That spoiled me. The numbers weren't very big, though. Okay, it's still an exciting way to get in there. It's a nice little, uh, it's a nice little hit on the caffeine or drugs, whatever you want to call it. What, uh, what are you excited about today? What am I excited about today? Well, to some extent, Christmas. We recorded this two days before Christmas. I'm on my second relationship. Been together 17 years. It's the first time in those 17 years we've actually got all five children in the house together in two days' time. That's pretty oh, wow. exciting. That's um, that's <laughs> awesome. Merry Christmas, by the way, to anyone who's listening. Hopefully you're not listening to us on Christmas and you're doing something slightly more fun. But either way, we're going to do our best. Um, two, two biggest wins to date, Peter. The two biggest wins in terms of angel investing. We'll say um, angel investing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, lots of other things in life. Um, obviously, the one I've just mentioned, and another one that's, um, I can't give you the X, but it's it's reasonable. That I, I put a reason amount in. I don't know if you've heard the term life-changing, house-changing, car-changing. Have you heard that term? Yeah. Um, so the first one I did was got me to the angel scene, so that's life changing, but the amounts of money weren't very high. The second was car changing. <laughs> oh, 
don't worry, we'll be replacing that car with something automated soon. Exactly. What's um anti-portfolio, biggest company you missed or said no to? Uh, yes, well, two things there. One is, a uh, years ago, between my two marriages, I was going out with a, a lady whose son was setting the business, doing hydroponics. <clears throat> this is uh, for using light and water and, and nutrients to, to grow, which is 99% used for growing cannabis. So I didn't invest in that. <laughs> 5k would have bought 5,000 pounds would have bought me half the company and you know on exit that would have been worth about three million that one i missed oh that's a massive i didn't feel comfortable with this you know this the field he was in uh secondly the other one i missed that i and one of the things you must never do as an angel is, is be subject to fomo fear of missing out that you must never do that but it, you, you asked me the question so the other one was swift key the swift key exited in, in the uk to microsoft about a year and a half ago for 250 million dollars, I think was the number, or 250 million pounds. I have an email train of me on the train about to, with seven of us, about to invest in it, and the deal lead was busy or went on holiday, and so this drifted off our, our inbox. The reason I say this, because I, when I found this out, and a very close friend made a decent amount of exits on that uh, as an angel, I went back and they instigated deal lead shadowing and education in the payment angels. We've got to have more people there that have the bandwidth and, and the ability, of course, to lead deals. So that is the one that I will, I will say. And that, that would have made, that would have been house changing if I had invested in that. Still, sounds like it's a great learning experience and you don't make the same mistake twice, and, which is well, critical. I'm sure to make the same mistake. I can't stop with them. So what podcasts, blogs, resources, et cetera, do you go to on a daily, weekly basis to get the insights on the industry? Very few. It's interesting because I've said at this podcast and I'm not really a podcast listener. So I, I have been listening for about four or five years, but my life is so busy. Uh, but the only time I can listen to them was when I'm cycling around London. I have one of these fold up bicycles. So I use a motorbike here in Cambridge, which I can't listen to a podcast. And the rest of my life is so busy. So what would I listen to? I've not been asked that before. Obviously, I'm going to promote my own investors investor. And now I'll promote you, Matt, as you're in front of me. Um, but I, I can't answer that, unfortunately, because there's nothing. I, uh, not that I don't think I can't learn. I just haven't yet atta attached myself to podcasts to do that. What about any blogs, books, etc.? Uh, a number of books. I've, um, in fact, we were just talking about it the other day, because this, this project of mine will end up being a book. I've read quite a few books. I, I, I mean, obviously things like Crossing the Chasm, the Business Model Canvas, these are things that I use with my when I'm mentoring. Um, but there's nothing specific. I, I'm just about to set my New Year's Eve, New Year goals, uh, resolutions. I set a resolution at the beginning of this year to read four books, that was all. And I haven't finished the fourth one yet. So I better get on and read that. I just struggle with life. I mean, I have 120,000 emails a year come in and 30,000 go out again. I just, and, and I have meetings. I do, I've worked out recently, I do 3,200 hours a year what I'm doing. This is basically a full-time role. I completely understand. It can be incredibly overwhelming. I want a prediction. Next 10 years, what field or industry will dominate the world in exits and IPOs? Uh, we're not sure about IPOs. We don't seem to have many of those in the UK. The, one, the exits will be clearly when machine learning, deep learning becomes proper AI, there's huge amounts going on there. There's, there's a number of um, and, and capabilities being built up there. The big one that's not mentioned quite so much is personalized medicine. I'm just about to go on and invest in a startup on that journey. Um, so, the, you know, I'm, I don't know how old you are, but I'm probably 30 years older than you. I um, medicine, the rapid advancement of medicine are probably more important to me than they are to you <laughs> in terms of curing your cancers and so on. So pers personalized cures will be huge. I think it will be the back end of the 10 years rather than the beginning, whereas the AI will be doing the process. Of course, the 10 to 20 year mark is a level of robotization of labor, the, the, the hardware robots rather than the software robots, which are AI. Let's flip that on its head. What's overhyped today? Overhyped uh, AI. There's two two letters together in that sequence. Um, um, IoT, B2C I, IoT, Internet of Things. I don't think B 
B2B is, and in fact, one of my investments where I'm on the board, is a very narrow niche. It's maturation of concrete. In fact, we have a, a site in, in Geneva, in Switzerland, uh, using it at the moment. So, it's, so we've got a very tight niche. Uh, B2B works fine. B2C, the connected home, lots going on, but there's a lot of hype creating around the material. And you know, even the hype is extending to all the very big tech giants all competing with each other. There's got to be a fallout there somewhere. Especially um, if they're not recurring revenue. Exactly. That's the big issue, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's just the hardware and bomb that matters, not the materials, and not the ongoing stream. It's got to be, that's got to be changed around. And I have seven different connected home systems in my two homes here and in France. And I'm regarded as stupidly geeky by my wife. <laughs> you probably can't see it, but there's an S cam behind, behind on the shelves there. Um, I and can see something. <laughs> so, because I'm, I'm trialing it, and, and there's only one of these seven that I actually pay an annual fee for. But I just, I can't see the point. I can completely agree. Be very careful if they ever decide to get intelligent. You may have a robotic war at your hands. Yes. Google versus Apple versus everyone else in the home. Okay, I have one last question for you before I let you run, Peter. So I would like one piece of advice that you would have for early stage investors, people that are getting into the world of investing. What would you want to say to them or say to yourself when you were getting started? Um, I, it's, it's, you learn, you've got to learn. You've got to learn by dipping your toe in the water, which is probably through a crowdfunding platform. It doesn't have to be investing 10 or 20 or 30 or 50,000 euros or pounds or whatever. And that learning can be done online, can be done offline, obviously, with um, material, electronic material. But in the end, it's almost certainly, if you've got the ability to do it, learn from other human beings face to face. You know, the world's changing, of course, but actually spend some time with people like me and there's plenty of people like me around. That's the main, main um, way of learning uh, this. Learning, learning how well, learning enough. Hopefully, not to put you off, but learning enough that you can start investing. You've also clearly got to allocate a certain amount of capital to it out of your disposable income, and the 10 to 15 percent is usually mentioned. And another fact on that is, please, 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 once you put an investment in a business, reserve twice that, i.e., three times in total, cash for that business. So you can put the same amount again in because the business plan has gone wrong, because it never goes right to start with. And then probably another amount again to put on the growth part. So do not just use all your firepower in the first business of your investing. And to also prevent dilution, it's very important. With well, it is important. We could have a longer discussion about that. I'm not sure it is important. I think share, share price multiplication matters much more, which is dilution. The only reason dilution matters if you've got it up to a certain limit, which gives you a certain information right, board observer, etc. Below that, there, are, there is some data in the States which says, which goes against what I've just said, that if you only invest first time, you get a better outcome. Because that once you get a down round, if you're on the way up and there's a down round, you get reset back down again. This is a much bigger subject to discuss. <laughs> that is a much bigger subject to discuss, and it's time to get ready for Christmas. What did you yeah. ask Santa for, Peter? Um, uh, uh, not for anything that I don't want. Strange question, that isn't it? But anyway, happiness on the day, having my five kids together with my wife and etc., and just having a really great time. So, not uh, material items are not needed in my life. You know, if I want something, I go and buy it. I don't want it as a present, particularly if it's not the right thing. I just want to have a great time on that day. Completely agree. It's funny, right? As we bring up Christmas, the audio quality comes back. Guys, thanks for tuning in. You probably didn't hear this before Christmas, but hopefully it brightens your day a little bit. Thanks for coming on today, Peter. Cheers. Thanks, Matt. Cheers. And if you guys want to learn any more about the syndicate or about, no, I forgot to ask you this, Peter. This is incredibly important. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? Connect with me? Well, that's difficult because I'm just totally overconnected. If they want something from, if they want a potential investment, they A, check my criteria, and B, somehow come in warm to me through somebody else. Coming in cold, there's little hope of actually getting any investment from me. If they want advice, then the reason I did this project, the Investor Investor, was to scale myself, because I just haven't got time to give out all the things I can do. I mean, this is this is effectively doing at the moment, isn't it? I don't know how big your audience is, but hopefully it's more than just the two of us, and therefore you, you know, they'll be listening to my pearls of wisdom if they are that. Uh, so it's it, electronically it's the best way to get access to my knowledge and experience. 
But if you want face to face, something like that's really difficult, but you must come in warm somehow. And that's the point of the podcast. So we can get awesome people on, make them exponential, and you and I can steal all of their great inspirational knowledge and insights. Guys, if you like this, the syndicate.vc and petercowley.org. We'll have links in the show notes for everything. You guys can check out Peter. You can check out what we're doing. Join our syndicate. Look at our round tables. We've done some pretty incredible ones lately. And reach out to Peter if it's a good investment, if you fit his thesis. If you don't fit his thesis, he's obviously just going to ignore you. But, exactly. uh, yeah. Thanks, Peter, and have an awesome holiday. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Thank yeah, you. cheers, guys. Happy holidays. Cheers. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye.